Hello and welcome to ADAA's webinar on CBTI or Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Insomnia, What You Need to Know. This is a follow-up um, to retouch base about CBTI from our previous webinar that you can find on our site. Uh, I would like to welcome our presenter, Dr. Virginia Runco. Dr. Runco is a licensed clinical psychologist and is a board certified in behavioral sleep medicine. She completed her postdoc fellowship in behavioral sleep at Johns Hopkins, and she has worked in sleep clinics and psychology group practices. The majority of her clinical work is on CBTI, but she provides psychotherapy for other conditions, including anxiety and depression. Dr. Runco, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. So. In this video, I'm going to be providing an introduction to cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, or CBTI in short, what you need to know. And I hope to answer these three questions for you. Should I try CBTI? What exactly is CBTI? And where can I find a CBTI provider or a self-help CBTI option? So first, when determining whether you should try CBTI, as the name suggests, this is a treatment for insomnia. The best way to get diagnosed with insomnia is to talk to a healthcare provider, even better if it's a sleep specialist, to really tease apart what's going on. And some of the things they'll be looking for is these various things in an insomnia diagnosis. So are there problems falling asleep and or staying asleep? Not all insomnia looks the same. So it could look like this where it's only a problem falling asleep and or there could be some waking up throughout the night, fragmenting the sleep and or there could be undesirable early morning awakening. So waking up too early and being unable to fall back asleep. Moreover, Insomnia is associated with daytime symptoms, so it trickles into the day in a negative way, maybe through increased fatigue or concentration difficulty, irritability, anxiety, and worry about sleep. Insomnia is also not just a one-off night, right? There's some persistence or chronicity with it, and so it's usually going to be at least a few times a week for at least a few months to kind of reach that level of becoming an insomnia disorder. Insomnia is not about inadequate opportunity for sleep. Insomnia is when we're providing enough time to try to sleep and we just can't fill up that time with sleep or with good quality sleep. Something that comes up when we're trying to figure out whether or not someone has insomnia or should try to treat the insomnia is, well, what if there's other stuff going on with the person besides the insomnia, coexisting conditions. So as an example here, let's think about anxiety. So someone can have, often has both anxiety and insomnia. So do we treat the anxiety and just assume any insomnia will disappear with that? Or do we approach both? And the guidelines currently are to treat both of those set of symptoms because it seems like when insomnia co-occurs with something else, it's not so clear cut and there can be this bi-directional relationship where it feeds on each other. I think anxiety is a really clear example for anyone that has this knows that yes, anxiety can contribute to insomnia. We can have mind racing and all this kind of at night, making it hard to sleep. But if you don't sleep well, that can increase anxiety and give us more reason to be stressed out as well. And so we're in this vicious cycle. So again, the guidelines are, even if there's something else going on, whether it's anxiety or chronic pain or menopause, that we do try to address the insomnia as well as whatever that coexisting condition might be. And how do we treat that? Well, right now, the first line recommended treatment for insomnia is CBTI. This is a non-medication approach to treating insomnia, and it is recommended by the NIH the American Academy of Sleep Medicine and all these other bodies based on the science and the research. So the science tells us that CBTI does the best. And this is more so than sleeping pills. And I know what you're thinking because pretty much everyone out there is taking a sleeping pill or is taking something over the counter maybe for their sleep. And even though that's typically what happens in the real world, research wise, what we know clinically is what is more effective though, is to try CBTI. 
Now, if you happen to be one of those that did find your way into taking sleeping pills, it doesn't mean you can't try CBTI. You can still try CBTI. It doesn't preclude you from doing it. But if you're kind of starting off from scratch and you're having a sleep issue and you haven't done anything for it yet, going to CBTI first before considering sleeping pills is what's recommended by the guidelines. And this is for adults. Some adolescents can also benefit from CBTI and even some younger than adolescents. But again, trying to loop in a provider for these diagnoses and treatment considerations, especially for the younger kids. So hopefully you have some clarity about if you should try CBTI, but what exactly is it? So I like to think of a seesaw of sleep and wake as we talk about this. So we already talked about how CBTI is not medication. What it is, it's a set of strategies, a menu of strategies, if you will, that you can try to stack things in favor of sleep instead of wake during the desired sleep period. So if you imagine a seesaw and think on one side we have sleep and there are sleep promoting factors that are weighing onto the seesaw to weigh that down so you can be sleeping, right? On the other end of the seesaw, there's wake and there's wake promoting factors. Again, our anxiety example where the wake factor could be stress, anxiety, racing mind, right? And so that's weighing down the wake side so that when we're trying to sleep at night, it's this balance of sleep and wake that ultimately determines are we going to be asleep or are we going to be awake? And so again, thinking CBTI as a way to kind of lift up, I'm sorry, to increase the sleep promoting factors to weigh down the sleep side and also decreasing and identifying and decreasing wake promoting factors to lift up the wake side. So CBTI is conducted across about four to eight sessions spaced about one to two weeks apart. And again, there's this menu of strategies, if you will. The first one is called stimulus control. Stimulus control is a strategy that's intended to decrease conditioned arousal. So, you know, what the heck is conditioned arousal? So conditioned arousal is based on classical conditioning or learning principles that we first learned about with Pavlov and his dogs about how you pair things together and we had these automatic associations that form, right? So how is this relevant to insomnia? So during moments of insomnia, we are often in bed awake, right? And so what that's doing is essentially pairing the bed with wakefulness and not just being awake, but sometimes a more physiologically activated state of awake, like anger, frustration, agitation, worry, anxiety, distress. And so when those moments of wakefulness are paired with the bed over and over and over and over again, then the bed itself can now be a cue to automatically elicit those feelings of wakefulness, just like that bell for Pavlov's dogs automatically caused them to salivate over some pairings. So that is what conditioned arousal is. It's learned activation with the bed through these associations and pairings over time. So how does stimulus control handle this? So stimulus control attempts to decrease conditioned arousal by breaking the pairing of bed with wake. Right? So what does that look like in terms of the rules of stimulus control? So that means you've all heard this, right? You know, don't use your bed for anything except sleep and sex. So no eating in bed, no working in bed, no watching TV. So you're supposed to get all those things out of the bed. So disassociate wake activities from bed. The other kind of rule associated with stimulus control is that if you're trying to sleep and you can't sleep and you're awake, in those moments of insomnia, you're supposed to get out of bed, right? So you're trying to decrease wake pairings with bed. Also by doing all this, stimulus control can increase conditioned sleepiness because now the bed is more one-to-one -one paired with just sleep, bed, sleep, bed, sleep, bed, sleep, strengthening the pairing of bed with sleep and falling asleep quickly. So increasing conditioned sleepiness. So then the bed becomes a cue for sleepiness, not for wakefulness. And very importantly to note that this may take time, right? So stimulus control is not a strategy that you use one night and expect to magically fall back asleep better quickly because you happen to get out of bed. It's more this long-term conditioning that we're trying to adjust. So going back to our seesaw of sleep and wake in terms of stimulus control is trying to decrease awake promoting factor 
of conditioned arousal, and it's increasing a sleep promoting factor of increase of conditioned sleepiness. Next, and arguably the most effective component of CBTI is sleep restriction. So when you start sleep restriction, you are first usually keeping sleep logs to get a sense of what your sleep looks like, and then you tailor a sleep restriction schedule for your sleep. And so for in this example, someone keeps a sleep log for a week or two, and on average, going to bed at 11, getting out of bed at 10. Yellow is wake here and gray is sleep. And so you can see that there's a lot of insomnia going on. Even though they're spending all that time in bed, when you add it up, they're only getting about four hours, 45 minutes of total fragmented sleep. So once you have that number, you use the sleep restriction protocol to reduce your sleep opportunity to closely match what you're actually sleeping. And so in this example, because it was close to five hours of actual sleep, the protocol would be to decrease the sleep opportunity window to about five hours by either going to bed later and or waking up earlier. The goal of sleep restriction initially is to improve sleep quality, to improve the ability to fall and stay in a sleep better, to consolidate sleep. It's not about sleep quantity or the amount of sleep that you're getting, because certainly in this example, five hours of sleep isn't going to be enough for the vast majority of us. But we're first trying to train the body to just fall asleep and stay asleep better than it had been. And it works this way because we're trying to use our sleep drive system. So sleep drive is the sleep pressure that our body can build the longer that we spend awake. And so if you stay up later, you're building up more pressure to sleep. So by the time you go to sleep, you'll hopefully fall and stay asleep better. Similarly, if you set a wake up time and you prevent yourself from oversleeping, you wake up and you're probably gonna feel sleepy some of these days, right? You may not have slept really good at night, but even if you had, you've only gotten maybe four or five hours of sleep on this protocol at least. And think of that as you're starting out the day with some sleep drive or sleep pressure. And then you stay awake and you stay up late at night and you've got all this added sleep pressure to help you then for the next night to jostle things in place to have more consolidated sleep. So that's the initial stage you're trying to get at. Then you work on sleep quantity by very gradually extending the sleep window. So in this example, the protocol is you increase the sleep window maybe 15 minutes or so per week. You're not gonna go from a 2 a.m. bedtime and now jump to a midnight bedtime. That's oftentimes too much of a shift for the body to adjust to. But if you go there slowly, you can roll out the sleep and yet preserve the sleep quality. So we're really trying to retrain the, the body this way. Sleep restriction works to increase a sleep promoting factor, which is that sleep pressure, that sleep drive. And unlike stimulus control, sleep restriction can have a much more immediate, a quicker effect on our night to night sleep. Next is cognitive therapy. And so cognitive therapy is the C part of CBTI. Everything else is really B. So they're all behavioral strategies. What do you do to try to sleep better? C part, cognitive therapy. So cognitive therapy is about thoughts, cognitions, which can include worries. Worries and anxiety can be helpful and adaptive. They have stuck with us through time because they were evolutionarily adaptive for us to detect threats and be worried enough about them to come up with a solution or to run away and have the energy to do that with our fight or flight system, right? But worries can easily tip into an unhelpful category where there's nothing left to do, if you will, to solve the problem. And now we're just ruminating and getting worked up and we're kind of on this hamster wheel loop. The example with insomnia that can be helpful to understand this is worries about sleep specifically can then lead to self-fulfilling prophecies. So being awake at night and starting to naturally be concerned about the consequences. I'm gonna be a wreck tomorrow. I'm not gonna be able to do well during that presentation. And that can work us up causing a wake factor that then makes it actually more likely to not sleep well, right? So we're kind of in this vicious cycle and loop. So cognitive therapy tries to break this loop. So the thought aspect of it, it's a technique to identify and replace unhelpful thoughts with more balanced thoughts to reduce distress. Cognitive therapy is not merely 
positive thinking, right? It's a little bit more nuanced than that. So don't worry, be happy. If people have said that to you before, you probably didn't appreciate it. So we have to be mindful about how we execute and use cognitive therapy. So just to know that that's not the same thing. So as an example, a worry could be, I'm going to be a wreck tomorrow if I don't sleep well tonight. Maybe a lot of us have had these thoughts, right? I think it's helpful to just step back and first appreciate what's helpful about this piece of worry. What's the adaptive piece of it? Well, it identifies that sleep is important. It makes us feel a certain way the next day. And so maybe the helpful piece of that is to prioritize and think, okay, I got to find ways to improve my sleep, right? Um, just a note here, this can get into a little bit of a rabbit hole because there's so much information out there. I know you're on YouTube looking at this right now. There's so much information out there and you could try this or that or get that gadget and read these books and you're trying all these things to help your sleep, right? And we can almost hyper-focus and have so much sleep effort that that can then contribute to the sleep problem. So I mentioned this just to say that, you know, it's not black and white here. You know, it's a balance of figuring out what we can do, but not hyper-focus at the same time, because that might actually make things worse. So that's a side note. But once we've acknowledged what we can do, that piece of it, then we think about how to reframe it so that this worry doesn't interfere with our sleep any more than it has to. So how do we replace the worry with a more balanced thought to reduce that distress? It could sound something like this. In the past, when I've slept poorly, I felt tired and sleepy the next day, but I'm usually able to accomplish the major things I need to do. Okay, so it's not an overly positive statement, but it doesn't sound maybe as scary or as distressing as that initial worry of I'm gonna be a wreck tomorrow if I don't sleep well tonight. In this model, we're decreasing wake promoting factors with cognitive therapy by trying to decrease those worries. Relaxation training. So there's lots of options out there, including breathing exercises, including diaphragmatic breathing, progressive muscle relaxation, imagery or visualization, many others, meditations, mindfulness meditations. And ultimately what we're trying to do when we try those is to decrease our stress and anxiety because that can also be a wake promoting factor. And I don't think there's a one size fits all of this is the best ever relaxation or breathing technique. It's really about trial and error and trying out a variety and just figuring out what works for you for the purpose of what makes you feel the least anxious and the least stressed, the most calm right after you're done doing them. And last, and not um, accidentally last, is sleep hygiene. So sometimes CBTI gets conflated with sleep hygiene. They are not the same thing. Hopefully you realize at this point of this talk that they're not the same thing. I often see people with very chronic insomnia that have the best sleep hygiene. They are doing everything right, but they're still significant insomnia. But we include sleep hygiene as part of the CBTI package usually because it's pretty wise just to double check to make sure that something obviously um, wrong isn't at play here. So these are kind of those lists of like do's and don'ts for sleep, kind of the common sense things, right? And so identifying and decreasing weight promoting factors like caffeine, alcohol, nicotine, excessive liquids, device, devices, device usage like iPhones, iPads, light, noise in the environment or discomfort in the bed, the mattress, the pillow. Also a common sleep hygiene tip is to increase physical activity and increasing exercise because that can make us sleepy. Although given the timing, it could actually make us more activated and then impair our sleep. So you gotta be careful about the right kind of timing for you. And again, that's not a one size fits all. You have to kind of experiment about the right time where it doesn't ramp you up before then. So now the question is, you know, Dr. Runko, that sounds great to me. Where can I find somebody to help me with this though? Cause it seems kind of complicated and I might have questions, right? So see a provider I think is ideal. If you can't find that, I'm gonna give you some self-help CBTI options. So when you see a CBTI provider, it's likely gonna be a psychologist. There's only about 200 that are board certified in this. And here are the websites for those directories. Here's a couple other directories I'll share with you. And these will have CBTI providers that may or may not be board certified. CBTI can be conducted individually, which means one therapist, one patient, right? One-on-one. -on -one or it can be in a group context. Usually you're gonna find probably someone that's doing individual CBTI out there. 
and you can get it delivered either in person or increasingly since COVID via telehealth. In terms of self-help options, I used to have a lot more book recommendations, but not many people read books, but I did want to at least include my favorite book of CBTI, which is Quiet Your Mind and Get to Sleep. I think this is a very readable book um, for folks out there to follow. Some internet options, Path to Better Sleep, Go to Sleep, Sleepio, Sleep Station. I don't know as much about Sleep Station, but I did include it here because there's an integrated human support component, which the first three here do not have. In terms of apps, Insomnia Coach, Night Owl, Sleep Coach, and Som Rest, which if you happen to know Shut Eye, they used to be called Shut Eye and now it's called Som Rest. So you might have some clarity on these three questions, but you still might be plagued by one nagging question still. But what if CBTI doesn't work for me? Indeed, sleep and humans in general are incredibly complex. CBTI is not a one size fits all solution. Even though I gave you that slide before saying that CBTI is the first line recommended treatment based on the science and research. Yeah, that means it's the best we've got. That doesn't mean it works for everyone. Importantly, I think we need to consider adaptations. More often than not, in my practice, I'm not following CBTI by the book. I'm adapting it in some way to, again, fit it to the complex nature of each individual sleep and other factors that are at play, right? This is such you know, a prominence that recently experts of CBTI got together and created this very comprehensive text, which is more so for, for providers than the layperson to read, called Adapting CBTI for those with chronic pain. It has chapters on pregnancy, on perimenopause, on cancer, on traumatic brain injury. And so it's you know, appreciating and trying to grasp that humans are complex and the way we've envisioned CBTI, it's not a rigid strategy that we have to do X, Y, Z. Okay, even those can study that way, but we should adapt to make it work better for people. Also, if CBTI, you give it a go yourself and it's not working for you, it's absolutely time to see a professional or if you're seeing a professional, maybe another professional. And this is to ensure, right, that CBTI is done well. And I say well here in quotes, because again, CBTI that Joe is doing may not be the right flavor or adaptation of CBTI that Jane really needs. And so seeing a provider that can kind of tease that apart. It might be helpful for also uh, additional workup, seeing a new provider or a different provider for additional workup and examine what's going on. Maybe that leads to additional treatments. I leave you here with some additional resources that you can read up about. I hope this has helped you to uh, learn more about CBTI and feel a little bit more confident and more knowledgeable on your journey for better sleep. Best to all of you.